So if you revise what we have seen in the last class, we have started with the impedance on a transmission line. So using the equations of the voltages and currents, we have defined that the impedance is also going to be a function of the distance. And we have, first of all, we derived the equation for the impedance by having the loss E. And after that, we have derived uh, the input impedance by considering the line is a lossless. Sir, so uh, if you rec yeah. Uh, sir, there's one question related to like a square we have, we have two opposite charges Q and minus Q. And yeah. uh, one corner we have one port. So what hmm. will be the potential mid in the square? So, what is this? Uh, this one only? Oh, this is the other topic what you are asking. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Tell me what is that question? Uh, sir, here we had like a... Uh, if the leftmost, uh, like A, B, C, D, if we rename, uh, name them. Okay. Uh, what is it? Okay. We have B and B are uh, plus Q and minus Q charges. Okay, this is an assignment question, right? Whatever I have yes. given. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. So something I have given, there, I have applied a voltage of 1 volt, I guess, right? Yes. Sir. Yeah. You can see here, suppose... one uh, solution mm. also. Mm. So, according to her approach, also seems right. But uh, uh, can you tell mm. us, like, uh, that one is, uh, is it fine or like uh, we need any other method for this? No, no, that's what I was telling you. If this is the charge configuration, see, one charge is located here, the other charge is located here. Okay, yes, this is an example of the dipole, right? Yes, sir. One is positive charge, the other one is negative charge. So when you consider a dipole, where is an equipotential surface is located? Equipotential surface so radially outward. No, when you consider a dipole, equipotential surface is exactly lies at the midway. Because when you consider any point, because of this and because of yes, this, sir, yes, the sir. potential get cancelled. Isn't it or not? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. so this is positive charge and this is negative charge. So where is the equipotential surface lies now? This is along this. Uh, so that the entire wire will have that uh, same potential. Yeah, this entire plane, whatever I was saying is the entire plane. Because if you see here from this, it is always at equal distance. Yes, sir. Correct. Now what happened when you take any point on this one, because of this one and this one, it is going to be zero. Okay, but what happened? This has been already given a potential of one volt. Yes, so what is the meaning of that? Whatever the potential it is already, you don't have the control to change it. Okay. 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 So since it is an equipotential surface, because of this two, it will be contributing a voltage of zero. But whatever you have applied a one volt here, it will be maintained throughout because it forms an equipotential surface. Suppose if it is connected to ground means it will be zero volt. But in the question what I have given, it is not connected to ground. Yes. It has been applied a one volt, which means that one volt will be maintained throughout the play. Okay. Okay. So when you are moving on this midway plane, this one and this one has not going to contribute anything. Yes. Okay. So that one volt will be maintained throughout the plane. So wherever if you take the point, no, the one volt will be there. Understood? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the last class, we have discussed about the impedance. So when you see the input impedance for a lossless line, so I have given this equation, right? This is by considering that the line is set to be the lossless. So where beta L is basically set to be the electrical length of the transmission. And I have given an important point that based upon the electrical length, you will be able to estimate what will be the frequency range of operation. So that is what the main important of the electrical length. And we have seen the different type of transmission lines, like water wave transmission line 
and lambda by two lines and short circuit line, open circuit line and lambda by eight line. We have found uh, what is the input impedance for that, assuming that those lines are lossless. Okay, then I think we have started with the problems also. So I think two problems has been uh, covered already. Yeah, this problem I think we solved. So see the next problem. So see the question then. For a lossless line of length 50 centimeter with L is equal to 10 micro Henry per meter and capacitance 40 picofarad per meter is operated at a frequency of 25 megahertz. Find the electrical path length. So can you tell me how to do the electrical path length if you see the procedure it's very simple the electrical path length is equal to beta L. Can anybody tell me how to find out the value of beta? Anyhow the value of L is straight away given 50 centimeter and how to find out the value of beta? Just give me, na, give me an uh, approach how to do that how to find the value of beta based upon the given specifications. You can turn on microphone, there is no problem, so that uh, others also can understand. Just think how to find out the value of beta with the given specifications. Sir, we can do like a gamma hmm. is equal to root over of a R hmm. plus j omega L and G plus j omega C. R okay. and uh, huh. B zero. Huh. So uh, we will get I think omega root over of uh, L C equals to beta. Correct, correct. That's it. That's uh, what actually most of the people used to do. You know, uh, they used to do the method like this. So, sir, you told beta is equal to two pi by lambda. That is well and good. So, how they are finding value of wavelength was and safety of light divided by the frequency. So this is absolutely wrong. So because uh, since these kind of questions are given, uh, the immediate flash comes to our mind was how to find out beta. So they used to find out this kind of approach. So can you tell me where is the mistake lies in this? So we have assumed it's a free space. Exactly, correct. So the problem is high, lies in this free space. You have assumed it as a free space, but actually happens in a transmission line. I have not mentioned it as a free space. So I have given the value of L and C. So this method, you should not do that. Okay. In fact, you can apply the concept of the phase velocity. So you know that phase velocity is equal to one over root LC is equal to omega by beta. So from this you can get beta is equal to omega root LC. So then you can find out the electrical path length. So all the values are given. You can find out what is the path length. So the electrical path length is equal to beta is omega root LC into L. Okay, you can substitute all the values. Omega is 2 pi f, f is 25 megahertz and L is equal to 10 micro Henry per meter and capacitance is 40 picofarad per meter into the length of the line is 50 centimeter. You take it in meters, so that is 0 0.5. So please simplify and tell me what is the value you are getting. So once you are done with that, you share your answers. can verify you are going to get an answer of pi by 2 radians.
Okay, shall I go to the next question then? So you can verify if anybody not done, please do the simplification and you are going to get option C as the correct answer. See the this is the reverse air gate question. So in the transmission line shown, find the input impedance between node A and the ground. So you have to find out the input impedance between this node A and ground. See, actually I have given one point is missing here. The length of the transmission line is equal to lambda by two line. Just make a correction. So there is one statement missing. The length of this transmission line is lambda by two. So can you tell me what is the answer in that case? Is it 50 ohms? No. You can see here when you look from this particular side, when you look from this particular side, there will be some input impedance. Okay, so what is an input impedance? That input impedance will be same as your load impedance, correct? That is equal to 50 ohms. But where you are finding, you are finding the impedance between point A and ground. You are measuring the impedance between point A and ground, there will be already 100 ohms in parallel for that. So the impedance between A and ground is equal to the 100 ohms in parallel with the input impedance of the line. So what is the answer you are going to get? Calculate and tell me. 100 ohms in parallel with 50 ohms. Find out what is the value. 100 into 50 divided by 100 plus 50. So you are going to get 100 by 3, which is 33.33 .33 ohms. Okay, I'll go to the next problem. So do you have any questions here in this problem? So see here, the nature of the lossless line of lambda by 4 line length having Z0 equal to 50 ohms and it is terminated with a 50 ohms inductive load. So you have to find out what is the nature of the lossless line of lambda by 4 length having Z0 equal to 50 ohms and terminated with a 50 ohms inductive load. So what means that this is your lambda by 4 line and your inductive load of 50 ohms means that will be 50 into J. And the characteristic impedance is 50 ohms. So the question is asking about what is the nature of the input impedance? We just correct it here. What is the nature of the input impedance? Can you tell me what is the value? So the length of the transmission line is equal to lambda by 4. So it's simple, you should not take this much time. Can you guess what is the answer? Why you are taking so much time? Yeah, it is option D. It's simple, right? I already told you 
the lambda by 4 lines are said to be impedance inverters okay when you connect a short circuit load here it is appearing to be open here when you connect a open circuit here it is appearing to be short okay when you connect an inductive load it is going to be appear like a short circuit i mean capacitive load so because see here you can easily verify the input impedance is equal to z not square divided by zl so z not square is equal to 50 into whole square divided by j into 50 okay this is of the form what form it is minus j into some constant okay that constant will be 50 so what is the value you are getting minus j into 50 so basically when you see the capacitance you are going to express it as uh, minus j right so calculating the inductance you are going to write j into xl if it is a capacitive impedance you are going to write it as minus j into xc agree agree or not so if it is an inductance impedance is in the form of j into xl if it is a capacitance you are writing minus j into xc correct so this is also of the same form minus j into xc so the nature of the load is basically capacitive Any questions here? Next one. So when I say something, when I ask something, at least please try to reply. If I don't get the feedback means I will also get bored. I'm telling you keep on repeating this, but you are not listening anything. Okay, and anyhow, since you people are only 10 students, you can make as a make the session as a more interactive. If you're not giving any reply means there is no meaning. See the next question. There is a lossless transmission line of 50 ohms impedance is terminated with a load impedance of 100 ohms. Then find what is the maximum impedance on the line. This is a lossless line. Characteristic impedance is 50 ohms and the load impedance is 100 ohms. We have seen the discussion, extensive discussion on uh, the maximum impedance and minimum impedance. So you can use the formula for the maximum impedance. So the maximum <coughs> impedance is equal to Z0 into VSWR. Right? If you want, you can go through the theory that what we have discussed. So quickly tell me what is the VSWR here? Good. It is the highest value by lowest value. Okay. So you can directly substitute that. So Z0 equal to 50 and VSWR equal to 100 by 50. Impedance by low impedance. So you can calculate the maximum impedance itself is same as 100 ohms. Okay, similarly, find out the minimum impedance also in the same question. Find out the minimum impedance and tell me what is the value. 25, good. So Z minimum is equal to not by VSWR. Yeah. Z not equal to 50 and VSWR equal to 100 by 50. We're going to get 25 ohms. See the next problem. So this is a bit, uh, it's somewhat lengthy question. So try to understand this. So the 75 ohms lossless transmission line is first terminated with a short circuit, and the minimal ohms are noted. Okay. When the short circuit is replaced by a load resistance of RL, the minimal locations are unaltered. And the VSWR is equal to 3. Then what is the value of RL? 
So first to give, uh, go step by step. So in the first case, what he has done, there is a 75 ohms line, which is terminated with a short circuit. This is your first case. So in the first case, what he has done, the minima locations are noted. So in this case, he has found it out where the first minima occurred, second minima is occurred, third minima is occurred, and so on. In the second case, he has done the short circuit is replaced by the load resistance of RL. In the second case, the same thing he has replaced with a load resistance of RL and characteristic impedance is 75 same. What is an observation he has given? The minima locations are unaltered. So what is the meaning of that? Suppose if in the first case, if you get a first minima at two centimeter from the load, here also he is observed the first minima is two centimeter. So the minima locations in both the cases is remain same. And in the second case, extra one more point this fellow has given. So in the second case, he has given VSWR is equal to three. So he's asking you to find out what will be the value of RL. Can you tell me what is the value? Just take some time and think how to do this. And if you are not able to do, I will explain. Thank you. So when you see any RF uh, amplifier, so RF amplifier, they used to give a caution. So don't operate the amplifier without connecting any load. When you have a power amplifier, they used to mention, you should not switch on the amplifier without connecting any load. Can you tell me the reason why? It can damage amplifier. How, how much damage can happen? Is it a minor damage or is it a major damage? Because of the open circuit. See, since the load is open circuit, you can expect a 100% reflection back. Okay, can you answer me? What is the reflection coefficient you got? What is the reflection coefficient you got? Open circuit. What is the value I have given? Good. It is plus one, which means that the total voltage is getting reflected back with the same phase. Okay. If I apply a 10 volt signal here, and since there is no load, the full 10 volt is going to get additive on this. So as a result, what will happen? The net voltage on the line will be sum of forward voltage plus reflected voltage. So what happened in this case? You are pumping a 10 volt, 10 volt and the full 10 volt is getting reflected back. So all together because of the same phase, there will be a 20 volt signal, which is double that of what you are actually getting forwarded. So if the amplifier is giving a 10 volt, the amplifier has to be protected for 20 volt if it is open circuit. Is that correct or not? Because the moment once it is sending 10 volt, I have not connected any load. So where should that uh, voltage should go then? It should come back to the source only. So the moment once the incident wave and the reflected wave are in the same phase, it is a very dangerous problem. Because whatever the amplifier is sending, the full voltage will be in, in phase with the incident wave. So there will be a double to the, uh, double of voltage will be present, which can damage an amplifier. If suppose short circuit happened, it doesn't problem. It's a minor problem. It would have been a problem with the fuse, I can say. But if you try to turn on this amplifier without connecting any load, it's always a dangerous. So that is the reason why if you see the high end amplifiers and all, they will have a VSWR protection for an amplifier. Because if it is, if the amplifier cost is very high, you have to take care of all these kind of mechanisms and that. Why? Because we are all we are always not perfect when it comes to the reality. We always used to do some kind of mistakes. So if the cost of the amplifier is getting high, means he has to take care of, of all these kind of problems. So that is basically said to be the VSWR foldback, foldback mechanism. Okay.
but ultimately have understood the reason being why the impedance matching is required okay so there are two kind of the matching techniques are there basically if i classify the first one is nothing but the active matching techniques in active matching techniques means there are two things you can use a common collector amplifier and you can use a common base amplifier in one case see here what is the condition here? suppose if this is your primary line and this is your load initially this z0 and zl has not matched so what you can do you can connect a common collector amplifier in series so you can break the line and you can connect a common connector amp common collector amplifier which is closer to the load so in analog circuits you have seen the common collector amplifier is going to have a voltage gain equal to 1 so what is the meaning of that whatever the voltage is going to be delivered to the load is equal to whatever the voltage you have applied So do you think in this case matching is happened or not? So since the voltage gain is already 1, whatever the input I was giving, it is be, it will be able to deliver to the load. Is the impedance matching happened or not? In other words, the maximum voltage is transferred to the load. Yes or no? So the common collector is basically used if you want to require a voltage matching. So that means if you want to transfer the maximum voltage from the source to load, you can go for the common collector amplifier. Whereas this common collector amplifier cannot be used for the current matching. Because common collector amplifier is having a current gain which is very very huge. So if you want to match the current matching, you can go for a common base amplifier. and you can it very close to the load so since common base amplifier is having a current gain equal to 1 so what happens here whatever the output current is same said to be the input current so in this case you can minimize the reflections of the current so the common base amplifier can be used for current matching So basically there will be a reflections in the form of voltages and there will be a reflections in the form of current. So suppose if you want to reduce the voltage reflections, you can go for the common collector amplifier. If you want to reduce the current reflections, you can go for the common base amplifier. But actually what is the disadvantage here? If you see the common base amplifier, it will be made up of the transistor with a certain biasing scheme. Right, so let me draw the self bias circuit. So you are having these kind of things, right? So we'll have an emitter resistor and a bypass capacitor, and you will have a two biasing resistors. And here you are going to apply a DC voltage in order to make sure that the transistor works in the active region. And this is how you are going to collect your output, and this is where you are going to apply your input. Okay. What will happen if you want to make sure that this transistor is going to work in a linear region, the input base junction should be forward bias and the collector to base junction should be reverse bias. So that will be happened by applying a certain DC voltage. So the main problem with the active matching techniques was it requires the DC voltage biasing in order to make sure that the transistor should work in a linear region. The main cost of the transmission line will be in the order of thousands. If you want to purchase a DC supply or a DC power source, it will be in the order of lakhs. So do you think is it the practical solution?
that's it suppose if you have a dc sources already available for different application you can use it for reducing the reflection but if you are purchasing only for the intention of impedance matching that is not at all recommended right so the active matching techniques though theoretically it can reduce the reflections but actually if you see the feasibility maintenance and cost wise it is not suggested so you understood what is the meaning of active matching techniques right now then we will see the passive matching techniques in passive matching techniques also there are number of uh, techniques are there of course i am not going to discuss all those things which is because it is not there in the gate syllabus i can ignore that so there are a different stub matching techniques are there it, you can add a if this is your main transmission line you can add a parallel uh, one more transmission line so that the placement of this stub and the length of this another transmission line is going to ensure that the impedance matching is happen that and all theoretical part it's not required for the gate so i'm not going to tell you that so one uh, possibly uh, one simplest method i was going to tell you so initially if your z not is not matched to zl you can add a quarter wave transformer in series so you can add a lambda by 4 line similarly that what we have discussed in this particular case instead of common collector amplifier you can also add a quarter wave transmission line to do the impedance matching so how it can be done was see here it's a just a simple design so make sure that the lambda by 4 line is placed very closer to the load okay and i can assume that z not prime will be the characteristic impedance of the lambda by 4 line which i don't know initially i will try to find out what is the value of z prime in order to do the impedance mismatch impedance matching so for that i have placed a lambda by 4 line which is very closer to the load in that case can you tell me what is the input impedance looking from this side So anybody you can turn on the microphone tell me so what will be the effective input impedance when you look from this particular side z not a dash square divided by z ah. correct right this is a thing this is a simple thing what we have discussed z not square zl of course in this case lambda by 4 line is having z not prime so now what i will do if suppose by choosing a certain value z not prime if i was able to make the input impedance is same as my characteristic impedance is the impedance matching happened or not if i make sure that whatever the net input impedance looking from this side is equal to z not the impedance matching can be achieved or not it is yes impedance matching means you have to match the impedance so how to do the design in such a fashion that whatever the net input impedance when you look from this side if you are able to make the value is equal to z not if you are making sure that z in equal to z not the impedance matching is ensured as per that i equated the z in value is equal to z not so what should be the impedance in this case so z not prime whole square is equal to z not into zl so you require the lambda by 4 line having a characteristic impedance of something like this root over z not that's it so if you select the value z not prime using this equation you will be able to do the impedance matching so let me give an example you can understand it better so initially i have a 100 ohms line 
terminated with a 64 ohms load impedance so can you tell me what will be the value of characteristic impedance for lambda by 4 line if i want to do the impedance matching what should be the value of characteristic impedance of this it is it simple so so that will be is equal to geometric mean of this 100 ohms into 64 ohms so this is basically equal to 80 ohms okay but actually what is the problem is you know see here you have mentioned the length of the transmission line is lambda by 4 which means that this line can be effective only at a particular frequency that means it's a frequency dependent suppose if i change the frequency of the signal in the line you have to change the length of this particular line also okay that is a major drawback and the second major drawback is so whenever you are having a primary line terminated with zl if you want to add a lambda by 4 line you have to disturb the main line okay that is the main problem so that is the reason why they will go for the stub matching techniques where you need not to disturb the main line instead you can add another transmission line in parallel okay that and all will be there in the stub matching so that is not required uh, to study for the gate part so let's leave that part so in this case what actually you can do is the main line will be disturbed so the stub matching techniques will be generally preferred So any questions here you want me to ask you can ask now before going to the next topic next two more para, two more very important topics are uh, left over in this transmission line so we'll start with the s parameters i didn't understand your question why is this part required to understand if it is not useful which one you are talking about about so you said this uh like this particular way is actually not useful uh because which one? of Active the drawbacks no no compared to the active matching techniques this method is much much better right but still there is a drawback okay okay, okay there is a drawback means if if you are uh, operating the transmission line at one frequency it will be beneficial okay okay sir yeah correct but even see even whatever i was talking about the stub matching techniques there also the problem with the wavelength is there see because whatever the length uh, you are going to to there it is also the frequency dependent so the frequency dependency drawback is there in all the case but the main problem what you have overcome from this method to this method was disturbance so when you want to add this particular line you need not to disturb the line whereas in this particular case sorry in this case you need to disturb whereas if you want to add here the primary uh, line has to be break broken yeah so next we will discuss about the s parameters this is a very important topic and you have to concentrate more here okay. so basically you have studied about this s parameters in microwave engineering right it is basically not a part of emt but you have studied emt and microwave all are related and even i can say the antennas everything all together you can say electromagnetics so what is basically s parameter says it is same as say how you have your network parameters like in networks you have defined z parameter y parameter h parameter but what is the difference between this and this one was all these z parameter hybrid parameters are applicable only at the low frequency okay where you will be able to measure the voltages and currents 
but actually when you go to the microwave frequency range when you see the circulators directional couplers all these things there is no provision to measure the voltage at the input port okay instead of discussing about voltage and current there you are talking about power input power output power coupled power all these things so when you go for the high frequencies especially in the microwave range okay or in other words the transmission lines operated at high frequency so voltage and current may not be convenient be conveniently can be able to measure so there you are talking about powers there comes the analysis of the s parameters so the s parameters will be helpful to analyze suppose if there is some incident wave you can analyze what will be the reflection and what will be the transmission into the second port so if you are having a two port network or a three port network so where the power will be divided you can easily apply the s parameters in that case so let us consider that this is your two port network so you can assume that this is my main transmission line i am going to apply one volt here one voltage source and here also i am going to apply one voltage source so in that case this can be done all the transmission line analysis can be done using a s parameters so first let me define so there is an incident wave here so let me call it as a1 and there is a reflection from the port 1 i can call it as v1 and this is your incident wave at port 2 and this is your reflected wave at port 2 so let me call it as port 1 and this is my port 2 so what actually as per the diagram you can say that so you can assume that a1 and a2 are the incident wave at port 1 and port 2 and b1 and b2 what actually it indicates b1 is the reflection from port 1 b2 is the reflection from port 2 okay b1 is the reflection from port 1 and b2 is the reflection from port 2 okay sir since you are talking about transmission lines your a1 b1 a2 b2 will be in the order of voltages because as i mentioned in a transmission lines we are doing the analysis in terms of voltage and current so you can assume that all these are all voltages at the moment but actually main application of s parameters will be in microwave where we are talking about powers but as of now you can imagine that all these things and all voltage only whatever a1 a2 b1 and b2 i was calling it as a incident voltage and reflection voltages because this is confined our discussion to transmission lines okay now if we carefully see what will be the contribution of b1 you can say so when you look at port 1 there is something which is coming out of port 1 so i can say that the contribution of b1 can be due to the reflection from a1 so if you apply some input here whenever there is an impedance mismatch happen there will be certain energy which will be reflected back so the first contribution for b1 is due to the reflection from a1 or it can be when you apply any incident wave at port 2 there should be some transmission from port 2 to port 1 so when you apply any input here, there can be a part of this energy can also getting transmitted into the second port so the contribution of b1 is basically the reflection from a1 or it can be the transmission from a2 agree so similarly can you tell me what will be the value of b2 so b2 also you can look at here b2 is also the contribution of transmission from a1 or it can be the reflection from a2 
I can say it is the transmission from A1 or it can be the reflection from A2. So if you, uh, if you simplify what you are going to get, using your superposition theorem, what you can say? Some constant to A1 plus some constant into A2. I can call it as S11 and S12. Okay, similarly B2 also can be written as S21 into A1 plus S22 into A2. So if you put all this, these two equations, this is your very, very important equations. Let me put it in a matrix model. So I can say these two are my resultant matrix. B1 and B2 is the resultant matrix. And all these equations, I can put it in a matrix of S matrix. S11, S12, S21 and S22 into, you can say A1 and A2 will be the incident matrix. Now, if you multiply these equations, are you going to get the same equations or not? If you multiply these two on, are you going to get the same equations or not? So, what I can call it as, this output matrix, I can call it as a reflection matrix. Because you can see here, B1 and B2 are said to be the reflection from port 1 and port 2. And this one I can call it as a S matrix or the scattering matrix. And the next one A1 and A2, you can see A1 and A2, I can call it as a incident matrix. So those are the incident waves into port 1 and port 2. So I can call it as an incident matrix. So any questions here right now? So can you repeat B1 and B2 information? So how to listen carefully when I was explaining. So when your mind is not here, the problem will come. Okay. So first of all, when you see the contribution of B1, there may be some reflection from port 1 because this is your two port network. So it can consist of any element. So whenever there is an impedance mismatch here, what will happen? Some energy of A1 will be reflected back. So the first contribution for B1 will be the reflection from A1. Also, when you give some input here, some energy will be reflected at the port 2 and some energy will be transmitted into port 1. Okay, so some energy will be the contribution from A1 or A2 can also contribute for B1. So the same kind of symmetry you can applicable for the port 2 also. Okay, so the resultant matrix can be written as the S matrix into the incident matrix. Okay. Now, there are very, very important points are there which you need to remember about the S parameters. So what is the important points here was the first When any network, if you say it is a reciprocal, or before that, sorry, first we will discuss about what is S11 and all. So for that, let me write the equations again. So let me call first S11. So how to define S11 in this case? B1 by A1 provided your A2 will be 0. Okay, in this case, so let me draw again here. This is your two port network. And this is your A1 and this is your B1. Accident wave is A2 and reflected wave is B2. Can you tell me what is this called? So when you want to define S11, remember your A2 has to be equal to 0. So when you want to measure S11 at this particular port, you can see here that is the ratio of how much energy is reflected back when you give some energy here. 
So in that case, your A2 will be zero. So can you tell me what is this reflected voltage divided by the incident voltage? Gamma. It is basically the reflection coefficient, correct? So when you are measuring the S11, your contribution to will be zero, which means that there is no transmission from the second port. So the B1 is purely due to the reflection from A1. So the ratio of B1 by A1, which is also the reflected voltage by the incident voltage, is said to be the reflection coefficient at port 1. Okay. Similarly, can you tell me S21? Yes, S21 is basically B2 by A1 provided A2 is equal to 0. Which means when there is no power applied here, the B2 can also be contributed due to the transmission. So I can call it as a transmission coefficient. So when there is no power here, the B2 contribution will be due to the transmission from A1. So B2 divided by A1 is basically called the transmission coefficient from port 1 to port 2. So this is your port 1 and this is your port 2. So S21 is the transmission coefficient when the voltage is applied at the input and the voltage is reaching the output at the second port. So the transmission coefficient from port 2 to port 1. Okay, next case, similarly you tell me what is S22 is equal to B2 by A2 provided A1 is equal to 0. Can you tell me what is that? So S21 will be port 1 to port 2, right? Yeah, sorry. Correct. This is port 1 to port 2. Correct. So the second subscript is the input and the first one is the output. Correct. So this is the transmission coefficient from port 1 to port 2. And what about S22? S22 is equal to B2 by A2 when there is no A1. So I can say it is a purely the reflection part at port 2. Agree? This is the reflection coefficient at port 2. Similarly, you can write down for S12. So first S12 is equals to B1 by A2 provided your A1 is equal to 0. So B1 by A2 provided your A1 will be 0 which means that it is the transmission from the second port to the first port. So I can call it as a transmission coefficient from port 2 to port 1. Agree? So any questions you have here? So we'll do one thing here. There is some network problem because while I was writing, there is something lagging here. So we'll terminate the session here and we will get uh, login again. Okay. So you can stop here and.